Or good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'll figure out what part of the day it is here in just a minute. Uh, good to see everybody this evening. Uh, we'll begin our service uh, with number 424. Tell me the old, old story. We'll do the first and last verse. And when we uh, sing that last verse, we'll ask Brother Jim Conley, if he would, to lead us in prayer. Number 424. sisters in Christ. Uh, we're thankful, Father, to uh, see uh, others in our midst that uh, are not normally here. Father, uh, help us to grow in your word and the knowledge of your word. Uh, thank you for allowing us to be here to, to hear your word proclaimed this evening. Pray that we'll store your word up in our heart that we might be able to share it with others, that others might have uh, the opportunity to serve you. Pray, Father, if there's any among us that's outside of Christ, that they'll 
seeing the need to become obedient to the gospel. Please forgive us, Father, when we come up short. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> before we sing that next song and before I forget, uh, we announced this morning that Gerald Vanover's uh, daughter was uh, at uh, Johnson City. She had her baby today uh, around maybe 1 o'clock, 1.30, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, he is named Luke. Uh, so Gerald is, uh, is a grandpa again. And, uh, man, we're, uh, we're excited about that. And all the grandparents, you know uh, what I'm talking about. There's nothing like those grandkids. I don't have any great grandkids yet, but uh, the grandkids are, are just great. So uh, keep, keep them in your uh, prayers, and uh, hopefully everything goes good and they come home and everything's normal. Uh, our second hymn of praise tonight is number uh, 4 or 543, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. Let's sing the first and last verse. announcements this evening. Uh, remember uh, prayer meeting and Bible study on uh, Wednesday night, uh, 6 p.m. Uh, we're studying uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 2, uh, the seven churches of Asia. Uh, we've been looking to that for a few weeks and we're uh, on the church of Ephesus. At the present time, we encourage you to come and uh, take part in that study. Uh, also, uh, next Sunday, uh, our women's adult Sunday school class uh, will be starting back uh, over on the second floor of the GBI building. Uh, everything is uh, big enough that they can have class over there without any complications. So all of you ladies that were going to uh, the ladies' class over there, you're more than welcome to start back or you're welcome to stay here, uh, either one that uh, suits you. Uh, the Relay for Life, uh, I guess most of you know by now, it's, uh, they've kind of had some problems with that, and will not be uh, participating in the Relay for Life this year. Uh, so uh, those that have been donating items, uh, Brandon uh, mentioned this morning, just go ahead and have you a yard sale at home and uh, donate 10% of it to the church, and that'll be just fine. So uh, uh, just keep that in mind. And then butterflies, uh, we started butterflies back last week, and they'll, uh, we'll have butterflies this Tuesday at 10 o'clock, 10 till 12. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind, and all of you ladies that want to participate in that, uh, feel free to do so. And if you're still uncomfortable uh, with uh, being uh, kind of confined in uh, the sewing room and uh, sewing, uh, you just stay home, and uh, we'll get through this, and we'll get past it, and uh, we'll get back to normal uh, or some sense of normal somewhere in the future. So we don't know where those dates and those times are, but... Uh, we expect the Lord to get us there, don't we? Uh, any other announcements? Yeah, I'll start my class back next week, too. Okay. Uh, uh, new, convert class. new convert class starts back next week, too. I forgot that. And that's in the fellowship hall over in the GBI building. So there's plenty of room over there uh, to spread out. So uh, we're looking forward to getting back to uh, studying the way that we uh, had been before uh, 
this epidemic started and uh, we'll uh, continue our work for the Lord. Uh, in the way of prayer this evening, we have uh, several people on our prayer list. Uh, Samantha wanted us to add Easton to our prayer list. He's got a doctor's appointment in the morning. Uh, has uh, something on his finger that appears to be maybe a spider bite. Uh, so uh, keep him in your prayers. And also Ronald Deal. Uh, he is going to have some, he's got, going to schedule for some bypass surgery. And he's going to the Cleveland Clinic uh, this week. So uh, keep him in your prayers. Uh, also uh, Helen Shortridge, uh, that's uh, Jennifer Ellswick's mother. Uh, please keep that entire family uh, in your prayers. Uh, also, uh, James Street. James and Judy are uh, down at Lexington, and they're hopeful that they can move him on to Dallas on Tuesday. So please be praying about that. Uh, he's, uh, his arm is in a sling, his left arm, and he can't bear any weight on the right arm. Uh, can't stand on his right leg but they're trying to in rehab this week and tomorrow uh, they're trying to get him to the point that he can transfer himself from maybe a wheelchair into a vehicle or from a vehicle into a wheelchair and uh, trying to build up his strength in his other leg uh, but they're going to try to get him to Houston they'll be flying him down there uh, hopefully Tuesday so uh, keep that uh, in your special prayers. Uh, Stan Smith uh, had an accident and uh, injured some fingers, about 20-some stitches, three fingers and a broke bone. Uh, just uh, pray for Stanley that uh, everything goes well with him. We need him in the ministry and uh, healthy and whole. Uh, so uh, keep him in your prayers as well. Anyone else we need to make special mention of tonight? All right, Gary Jude's got some tests in the morning. Keep uh, Gary in your prayers. We had him on there, didn't we? Dan Fuller. Keep Dan in your prayers, and uh, hopefully his test turns out well. There's no one else. Our prayer hymn this evening is number uh, 539. Uh, we'll sing the first and last verse of that song. And uh, after we uh, sing that last verse, uh, we'll ask uh, Brother Harold Hibbets, if he would, to lead us in prayer for these that we've mentioned. Number 539, first and last verse.
younger this year. Oh, we pray for those in the household of faith that's not well tonight. It's in a hospital or sick at home. We pray that you ease their pain and heal them for your will. Jesus be mentioned on their paralytic for the street family that's going back to Texas. We pray they can do something for him that he can be up and about and move. These little children that's been mentioned to all that's sick. We just pray that you'll put your healing hand on them. Is there anybody here that needs to have the Lord's Supper? Would you raise your hand, please? Up here? Okay. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, our communion hymn will be... Number, will be uh, Must Jesus spare the cross alone, number 449. But over in Romans chapter 5, verse 8... The Bible says, but God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to think of that for just a few moments. The love that God had for all of us. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world. That's you and me, folks. He loved you and me that he would give his only love begotten Son, that whosoever should believe upon him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sacrificed his Son on Calvary's cross because he loved you and me. Not that we deserved it. Oh no, none of us deserved it. We deserve to be in hell. We deserve to be lost. But thank God for his precious love that he sent his son, his only begotten son, his only begotten son gave his life for us all. As you come around this table tonight, don't forget that love. Don't forget that price Jesus paid for you and for me. If you have not had the opportunity to be around the Lord's table, make your way down here in the front and the men be there to serve you as we sing. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be around the Lord's table this evening with these brothers and sisters. And Heavenly Father, as we remember <clears throat> the Lord as we're commanded to do on this day, uh, this morning we thought about the cross and the pain involved in the cross. But Heavenly Father, <clears throat> when we remember or try to remember everything about the Lord, we remember he promised us that he had prepared a place for us that are faithful. Amen. And Heavenly Father, he has promised us that he would come and receive those that are faithful unto himself. Yeah. We know that that was made possible by the cross of Calvary. Just help us just now to be mindful 
of the love that he had for each one of us. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. together be singing the last stanzas as these take their seats. From that same verse that I used for the communion meditation, John 3, verse 16, but I want to add verse 17 to it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Did you catch that? The world was already lost but that the world through him might be saved. God gave his best. And all he's asking you and I to do is to give our best when we give of our tithes and our offerings. Mm -hmm. Jesus came for one purpose. And that was in Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Before we knew Christ, we were lost. We had all had sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God gave his best. He gave his son. His son gave us his life. And when we give our tithes and our offerings, folks, we're declaring to the world we care about the lost as well. Father and God in heaven, we thank you once again for allowing us to be back in your house this evening. And as John said, let us give our best. Be with the gift, the giver, and remember the ultimate gift of all, which was your son. Thank you so much for him. In his blessed name I pray. Amen. Amen. decided to follow Jesus. And we pray that if you have not decided to follow Jesus, that you'll do so. You know, the Bible says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and to also the Greek. Amen. This song says, I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to stand and say that I love Jesus. I'm not ashamed to say I'm trusting in His Word. I'm not ashamed to lift up high the blood-stained banner because I'm saved. I'm not ashamed. Christians, we wake 
right up on the shelf. We're ashamed to lift our hands and praise. We wait on someone else. But Jesus died at Calvary. God's plan he did fulfill. And that is why I stand today trying to do his will. I'm not ashamed to stand and say that I love Jesus. I'm not ashamed to say I'm trusting in his word. I'm not ashamed to lift up high the blood-stained banner because I'm saved. I'm not ashamed. In this life we have his blessings, yet we fail to praise his name. He said if we were ashamed of him, to us he'd be the same. When he gave his life at Calvary, he did it for all men. So that I could stand and proudly say, I've been born again. I'm not ashamed to stand and say that I love Jesus. I'm not ashamed to say I'm trusting in His Word. I'm not ashamed to lift up high the blood-stained banner because I'm saved. I'm not ashamed because I'm saved. I'm not ashamed. I said, John, I want you to sing that song tonight since we're closing out the book of Jonah. And uh, he did a great job. I always appreciate Brother John and his uh, faithful, faithfulness to the church. Um, we're going to be closing out the book of Jonah tonight in Jonah chapter 4. And I've really enjoyed uh, this sermon series. Uh, four sermons, four chapters. And trying my best uh, with the challenge that it gave me to uh, summarize each chapter and to present it in a way that, that hopefully um, you've all taken something from it. And that's, that's the goal, right? And uh, especially something more than Jonah being in the belly of a fish. Uh, hopefully you've advanced from Sunday school kindergarten class all the way to big kid class now. And uh, if, if we ain't got you there yet, just come and see me and we'll study again. We'll try it again. Uh, but Jonah chapter 4 tonight, we're going to be closing out this series. And um, just to give us a little bit of an overview to get us back where we need to be, chapter 1. You, know, you go to chapter 1, it, it really is the whole setting of the story or the event of Jonah. Um, the Lord comes to Jonah, tells Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh. For their wickedness cries out before me, go and preach to these people. Simple command, to go preach. Um, Jonah's mindset, well, I'm not going. That's, that's it. And you get down to verse 3 of Jonah chapter 1. And when you read verse 3, um, and it gives you the setting, you already know something bad is going to happen. Um, you get down to chapter 1 verse 3, and the Bible says, it begins with, but Jonah arose the flea to Tarshish. Now, whenever God commands us to do something, and we put a but at the end of it to begin our sentence, and decide to go in another direction, it's not going to turn out well. It's not. And so Jonah, in his disobedience, uh, he decides to spend money to go in the wrong direction that God told him to go. Um, and, and when I think about that, I could just preach a sermon just, just on uh, verse 4 of chapter 1. 
But when you think about the money that Jonah spent to flee from the presence of the Lord, I really believe, brothers and sisters, that we need to count the cost of our disobedience and we might just live a little bit better. If you think about how much money you've, you have spent moving in the wrong direction of life, if you think about uh, what we do at times uh, to really flee from the presence of the Lord, and I really believe we need to count the cost. And so Jonah soon finds out that you can't run from God. You can run and run and run, but you'll never hide from Him. He finds this out, and he's thrown overboard in the midst of a storm. Uh, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And, and you, you think about this, God is so gracious and merciful that the Lord had prepared this great fish to swallow him. Um, and... Uh, and shelter him because of the consequences of his disobedience. That's a blessing that the Lord prepared for Jonah. And when you think about that, that blessing of the great fish that swallowed Jonah, brothers and sisters, shouldn't it excite us? Because in our worst moments of disobedience, the Lord somehow, some way, still sheltered and saved you from the consequences of your disobedience. Somehow, some way, through the blood of Jesus Christ, he showed you mercy and grace. And that should excite the church. Amen. And so chapter 2, you get to chapter 2, it opens with Jonah in the belly of the fish, and he's praying. And he talks to God, and, and, and he's praying for deliverance, and, and the Lord delivers him. And God is so gracious and, and merciful that, that God gives this fish an upset stomach, and the Bible says that the, the fish vomited Jonah onto dry land. He's grateful. And when we think about that uh, tonight as we close out this sermon, um, and, and we look at our past life, you know, thank God through the blood of Jesus Christ our past sins are forgiven. And thank God for that. And we think about uh, this event in verse 10 of chapter 2. You know, if I got the, even if I got the stench of what I was on me, people sometimes know who you were, but they don't know who you are now. But even though I may have that stench on my previous past life, I thank God that I'm not where I used to be. I thank God that I'm not who I am no more. I thank God He has delivered me from what I was stuck in. And we see that in chapter 2, that Jonah's delivered. And now it seems in chapter 3, Jonah's finally got some sense about him. He's obeyed the Lord. Uh, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time, the Scripture says, to go preach to the Ninevites. And he gets to Nineveh. He preaches a sermon. Now, the sermon that he preaches, it's not really a good sermon. I mean, I'm just, it's not a good sermon. Um, there's no eloquent introduction. There's no points to the sermon. There's no reference to the scriptures. There's no humorous illustration. If you read Jonah's sermon, and if I was a professor grading his sermon, sermon I would fail Jonah on his sermon. I mean, it's a horrible sermon. Eight-word sermon, and it goes like this. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be destroyed. That's it. Eight-word sermon. That's his whole sermon. In 40 days, the city will be no more. In 40 days, the wrath of God will fall on you. And he steps back, and he waits to see what happens. And the Bible says that the Ninevites, listen to this, the Ninevites heard the word, they believed, they repented of their sin, and they obeyed the gospel. They obeyed and, and believed in God during that time, according to how to believe in God in the Old Testament. And, and the Bible says that uh, from the greatest to the least of them, they put on sackcloth, sat down in ashes, and prayed unto God. What obedience during that time. A great city during that time. And the Lord sees that Nineveh, they heard, or heard the word, they believed, they repented. And, and the, the Bible says that the Lord relented on destroying that city. He changed his mind because the people had a change of heart. And the Lord sees the city repented. He decides to spare the city. And, and, and Jonah with his bad sermon and his bad attitude is one of the most successful prophets in all of Scripture. One of the most successful 
the prophets. Because with one sermon, an entire city had repented. Now you think that's pretty good, right? I mean, that's, that's a good prophet. He preached one sermon. He got over 100,000 people obeying the gospel. Until you get to chapter 4, where our text is tonight. Chapter 4, verse 1, it opens up with the word, but. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he became angry. He became angry. Now, the last time we heard but was in chapter 1, verse 3. And guess what? Things didn't go well with Jonah that time, did it? In chapter 4, we find out that the city has gotten right with God. God has relented of his decision to destroy. And Jonah's angry. He's not celebrating. He's not rejoicing. He's not welcoming uh, these men and women with open arms who've repented and obeyed. And Jonah sees this city gets right with God and he gets angry. Now, I can just imagine, I mentioned this last week, um, what if we had, what if the community of Grundy, those who are not in Christ, who haven't obeyed the gospel, somehow, some way, had found themselves one Sunday morning coming to a service here at Grundy and heard the gospel preached, and we had hundreds that day obeyed the gospel. That would be amazing, right? But I, was, I still find myself, some way, somehow, somebody would be upset about that. I mean, it's, it's obvious, and it's sad. That's the condition of a pe- person's heart. They would be so upset, well, we ain't got no words to say anymore. I mean, what's going to happen? Right? Well, you get so, so upset about this. And so here's Jonah, he's upset. And listen to what, God, what he says to God in verse 2 of chapter 4. He prayed to the Lord and said, Lord... Was this not what I said to you when I was in my own country? I fled previously to Tarshish, for I knew, I knew, God, that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Think about that. Verse 2, Jonah is praying to God in his anger. Say, God, I knew, I knew this was going to happen. When I came here, I knew who you were. You're merciful. You're abundant in loving kindness. You're slow to anger. I knew you was going to do this, God. And so God looks back at Jonah in verse 4. And he asks the question that's the title of our sermon tonight. Is it right? Is it right, Jonah, for you to be angry? The question I'm asking tonight, is it right? Let's pray. Father, I come before your heavenly throne as a servant. And I pray, Father, that um, as we take in consideration this question we're asking from the Scriptures this evening as we close out this series on your prophet Jonah, And we have examined each chapter. chapter. We have talked about this condition that Jonah was in and and what he put himself through, Father, in his disobedience. And and Father, I just pray that uh, the church doesn't have a Jonah complex. And that, Lord, if there, there are times where we find ourselves angry because we don't get what we want and how we want it, where we want it, when we want it, I pray, Father, that we will repent before it's too late. Father, I just pray that uh, if there's someone here that's in Christ and finds themselves being disobedient, um, finds themselves not doing what you've told them to do, I pray that instead of complaining and being angry about the situation and things going around in our world, that uh, they see that we have people who need to encounter the grace and mercy that you have to offer through Jesus Christ. Pray that you'll bless this message and bless those who are here and those who are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Is it right? This will go on in verse 5 through 9. So Jonah went out of the city. He sat on the east side of the city. And he made himself a shelter. And he sat under the shade till he might see what would become of the city. 
And the Lord God prepared a plant, and he made it, it come over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm. And so it damaged the plant, and it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat on Jonah's head, so he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die to live. Is it right? That's a question, brothers and sisters, I want us to take in consideration as we close out this series through the book of Jonah. A question when we take in consideration of what Jonah is doing. And when we look at this rhetorical question that's asked by God, we ought to examine our lives at the same time. Examine our lives as we ask the question, is it right? You see, Jonah went out to the city, a city that God told him to go to, to preach. And something happened when he obeyed God. A revival had taken place. People obeyed. And what did Jonah do? He left the city to the eastern side of the city. Now, God never told Jonah to leave the city. Never once did God come back to Jonah while he was in the city during this revival and said, Hey, Jonah, it's time for you to leave. Jonah took it upon himself with all that was going on when he should have been rejoicing and celebrating of the decision that was being made of the city of repenting. He took it on his own will to leave the city. And the Lord finds him in the eastern side of Nineveh And the Bible says God prepared a plant. Now I want us to take in consideration as we close out this, that word prepared, as I said when we preached from chapter 2, it comes from the Hebrew word manah. And you also see the word manna. Prepared, it means to provide. And so God prepared a great fish in chapter 1. as a blessing. And now we see here in chapter 4 that God has prepared a plant for Jonah. He's prepared a plant to, to make provision and shelter for Jonah. And Jonah thinks here, he, he, remember, he's left the city with his own will. God never told him. God, and he gets out in the eastern side of the city. God prepares a plant to cover his head to, to prevent misery and, and the sun. And so Jonah's thinking, hey, I'm back on good grounds with God. Everything is hunky-dory. And the Lord has given me provision and shelter. But what happens the next day? The Bible says in verse 7 that God prepared a worm. God prepared a fish. God prepared a plant. And God prepared a worm. Now there's a purpose for that preparation that God has given with this worm to Jonah. God prepared a worm and it withered the plant. Destroyed the plant. And then also in verse 7, God prepared a vehement or a strong east wind. Four provisions throughout the book of Jonah given to this prophet. A fish, a plant, a worm, and a wind. You think that's coincidence? I think not. And so Jonah, he, he has the shelter. And the worm eats the plant. And now he finds himself wishing to die. You see, brothers and sisters, no matter what shelter you make outside of the will of God, it will never sustain. No matter how much education you have, no matter how how much wealth you build yourself, no matter what type of job you have, no matter how successful you are in this life, if your life is outside the will of God, it will never sustain. It will never glorify the Lord. And so for everything Jonah has seen and, and witnessed God doing in his life, I mean, Jonah got outside the fish. That's a miracle in and of itself. He got outside the fish. But the problem is with Jonah, he never got outside of himself. He was stuck with himself. You see, the most miserable place in this world is not being in the belly of a fish. The most miserable place in this world is being stuck on yourself. Being self-me. Always about me. Always about what I want and how I want it. That's the worst place that you could ever be. You see, a lot of believers, 
They get delivered from their sin, but they don't get delivered from themselves. And so all life is spent in this shade of trying to live in my own comfort. Trying to live up to expectations while never living up to the full potential that Jesus Christ has for me in my life. You see, the Lord comes back to Jonah and asks him again, "Um, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Is it right, Jonah? And Jonah replied to God, Yeah, it is right, God. It is right for me to be angry. I would rather die than to live like this. Now, uh, the older parents, you ever had your teenage uh, children say anything like that? I wish I would die. I don't want to be here anymore. You ever heard that before? One time. Oh, <laughs> one time. Yeah, I used to say that all the time. You want to let me see my girlfriend? I wish I would die. I don't want to live anymore. You ever hear that before? And, I, and, Jonah, and God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about this plant, Jonah? And he says, yeah, I would rather die. Now, that's why I'm glad that you and I are not God. Because at this moment, when Jonah was going to act like this, I would have probably backhanded him with the right hand of fellowship in Christian love. <laughs> All right? But what does God do? He do? God doesn't strike Jonah dead. This is what he does. God sets up a series of questions for Jonah. He says, now let me get this right, Jonah. You're angry that this plant that was here one day and gone the next, you feel more sorry for a plant than you do for a lost people. Now is that right? Now what makes the book of Jonah unique here as we close is... um, that it ends with an unanswered question, the book of Jonah does. It ends with the Lord asking Jonah and asking you and me tonight, is it right? And the suggestion of what God is asking Jonah is to suggest that there are a few things about your attitude and your demeanor and your actions, they're just not right. And so we're going to ask this question three points tonight with this sermon. First question, is it right when you limit the grace of God. Is that right? You go back to verse 5 and 7. And you look at that account. And you see what Jonah has done. Jonah. He sought to set some boundaries. On who could experience. And who couldn't experience. The grace and mercy of God. In chapter 1. We don't know why Jonah runs from Nineveh. But in chapter 4. His reasoning becomes pretty clear. Nineveh as I said. Is the capital city of Assyria. A great city. And Assyria, uh, the Assyrians are the sworn enemies of the Israelites. Very evil, vile, wicked nation and city. And so Jonah has a lot of bitterness towards this city. uh, Because of what they can do and what they are and who they are. Now that sounds a lot like our situation that's going on in our world right now. A lot of people have a lot of bitterness towards one another because of something that they may seen or may heard or something that affects somebody else and it's going to affect me. We see that in our culture and our society today. A lot of bitterness, a lot of anger towards one another. And so Jonah, he has this anger and he goes in the opposite direction because he knows God. He says, God, I hate Nineveh and I know you. You are gracious, you are merciful, you are abundant in loving kindness, and you relent from a decision to destroy. And the reason I'm not going to Nineveh and not preach the word is because I know if they hear your word that they're going to repent and that you're going to be gracious, Father. You're going to be gracious and merciful to them. And you're not going to destroy them as you said that you were going to. And I'm in charge. They don't get to experience the grace And that's how many will live their Christian life until now, until the Lord comes back. They're the ones in charge who they're going to extend grace and mercy to. And isn't that interesting today when we see this mindset in in many in the church who, who really have experienced the grace and mercy of God through Jesus Christ and yet cannot extend, cannot extend a loving hand to another. Cannot share the truth of God. But, but, but we're so eager sometimes to give up on people, aren't we? We're so eager just to give up and cast them into hell. And we'll say, well, I'll pray for you. And that's about as far as it goes. I'll pray for you. What's that doing? We're not taking responsibility. We're not doing what we should be doing. 
And so Jonah allows his views to dictate the hand of God. He allows his traditions, his culture, his way of living to dictate who will or who will not receive the mercy of God. And he allows this perspective on certain issues to determine how God, and, God can and cannot work in a certain land. And so what Jonah does, and what we see happens today in our, in our culture in America, is uh, we get things twisted because of politics, don't we? We get things twisted because of traditions. And, and we put this above faith. And, and I want to remind us tonight, in, our, in, in this great nation we live in, praise God for it. Praise God for the United States of America and this nation and what it stands for, the democracy of it. But what we need to realize, brothers and sisters, is we are more than Democrat or Republican. We are more than conservative or liberal. We're more than a social economic sta status. We are Christian and Christian first. And our roots ought to go deeper than the American flag. Amen. Now, I love the American flag. I love the, this nation and what it stands for and what, and what the blessings we have. But our Christian faith ought to go deeper than that. Amen. We ought to stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because what's going to happen when this government eventually falls. And yeah. sadly, it will happen in time. Yeah. What's going to happen then if all your faith is in the government? You're not going to have a leg to stand on anymore, are you? See, man and government will fail, but the cross of Calvary will always stand strong. Yeah. And so Jonah is angry because he went down to Nineveh and told a city that they would be destroyed. Worst sermon ever preached in the Bible. Worst sermon ever preached. And he preaches... But he never says when he preaches, but. Never says that once. He never says, but uh, you're all going to go down, but if you get right with God, you'll be saved. He never says, if you change your attitude, God will save you. He never says that. He never says, if you get your life together, the Lord will have mercy on you. He preached none of that. And Jonah says, you're going down, and here's the problem. Jonah said what God would do, and God didn't do what Jonah said that he would do. Jonah preached destruction, and God brought deliverance. Jonah preached judgment, and God acted in mercy. Jonah said, it's over, and God said, you're getting another chance. And so Jonah's mad because God has reminded him, you can't put me in a box. You do not control me, Jonah. You see, no matter how big our Bible is sometimes... You can't set limits on God and allow, and just allow me to say this, in the season of our nation and where our nation is going right now, where God is being thrown around very loosely, and He is, I am scared for people who think they have God figured out right now. They, they think they can place God in one area or another and we can set boundaries on God and declare who God does and who God loves and where the grace of God is operating, where mercy shall or shall not be extended. I have problems, brothers and sisters, with Christians who want to limit and lock God into their own personal motive and politics. I have problems with that. We cannot limit or control God. We cannot say God is over here or God is over there. God hates them. God uh, will not show mercy to those. The Lord is greater than our commandment and God operates with a sovereignty that sometimes will absolutely challenge our thoughts and our way of living. And that's a hard code fact. It, it really challenges me sometimes in the culture and in the comforts of our society that, that we live in and what we've been raised up around, when you actually read and study the Scriptures, the challenges that it brings through our lifestyle, where we've become so comfortable. And God reminds us every day that He is God and you cannot control or limit the grace of God. Amen. And this is an interesting thing about Jonah. He says in verse 2, he says this, I know God. You're merciful. I know you're gracious. No, he didn't say, I heard you're gracious. He didn't say, I heard you're merciful. He says, I know. I know this. Now, how does Jonah know this? Jonah experienced it firsthand, didn't he? When Jonah was disobedient, 
He caught and was caught in the storm of the sea, thrown overboard. God provided gracious protection and mercifully gave Jonah a second chance. And so God is telling Jonah, I am merciful, I am gracious to, to you, and now you have the audacity to not want to be the same with somebody else who was in the, who's in the same position that you were once in. How can you receive grace and limit grace at the same time? How can you be forgiving? How can you have forgiveness and not offer forgiveness at the same time? Oh, last Sunday in Dennis's uh, uh, Sunday school lesson, he talked about forgive, forgiveness and forgetting. And you, we heard that term, uh, I forgive, but I, I don't forget. You ever heard that? How's that work out? Do you really forgive? That's just the thought. So how can you be forgiven and not forgive? How can we be abundantly blessed and curse somebody else? So this is a thought we must take into consideration. Second question. Is it right that you are consumed with anger? Is it right you're consumed with anger? Now we look at verse 8 and 9. After the, the plan is gone, the, the wind is sent to, and Jonah, the sun's beating on Jonah's head, he's angry again. But with and he's angry with God, but here's the duplicity. Jonah's all right when God does what he wants. Right? He's all right. When God spared him by the fish, oh, praise you, Father. Bless you, Lord. Right? Praise him, Father. And when God gave provision of a plant to give, of a plant to give him shelter, oh, Jonah was doing great. But the minute God does not do what Jonah wants done, what's Jonah do? He gets angry. You see, you can see the mercy of God toward Jonah. Not once, but twice. And God asked him a second time, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? You see, whenever God asks a question in the Scripture, it's not because God doesn't know the question. He knows the question. The reason God asks the questions, it's meant to change our attitude. It's meant to change our way of thinking. So whenever God asks a question, what God is trying to do to His prophets and to His people, and even to us today, is try to wake you up. Amen. Trying to wake you up. Telling, telling you, you really need to rethink what you just said. You really need to rethink what you're about to do. We need to get this straight. And so He asked Jonah not once but twice, is it right? And Jonah's response is, it is right, God. I have the right to be angry. And so he's angry and he talks to God in this prayer. And listen to his tone again in verse 2. Lord, was this not what I said when I was in my country? Very humble man, right? Very humble. I mean, it would make you feel so spiritual being around Jonah. He's a carnal devil is what Jonah is. He's so angry that he speaks what he should have had more time to think about. He's so angry that his mouth gets him in trouble with God. Now, somebody on your pew tonight ought to say amen because there's been a lot of times when you've opened that big mouth and it's got you in a lot of trouble, isn't it? Amen. You ever said something before you ever thought it? Or before you should have thought about it? Yeah. And how's that work out? Ooh, you burned him up, didn't you? Mm, you, told, you told her how it was. Here's what the Lord says to Jonah. Is that right? In the original Hebrew text, when you go back to this portion um, of God asking the question, um, in the original Hebrew, the question that God asked Jonah, it's not that, is it right? That's not the question that God asked. It literally says in the Hebrew, is that profitable? That's a pretty good thing. Think. Anytime I open my mouth, is somebody going to profit something from it? Is that profitable? Now, let me ask you. What are you gaining from your angry expressions? I want to ask the hotheads and the short-tempered people tonight, how is the anger working out for you? In our angry moments, we fail to be most like God. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't ever get angry. God has a righteous anger about Him. God does get angry, but let me share some scripture so that you don't misunderstand what I'm trying to get about. Psalm 145, 8, the Bible says, The Lord is gracious and merciful, 
slow to anger. Slow to anger and great in loving kindness. Psalm 86, 15, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in mercy and truth. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 3, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, in chapter 4, verse 26, he tells the Christians at the church at Ephesus, In your anger, do not sin. So, I think at times, before we blow up, before we say, before we think, slow down. Pause. Think about what you're about ready to say. You know, and that was a challenge for me as 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 I continue to grow. And that's what I love about the scriptures is it really challenges you to look at life in a different perspective. Because sometimes we like to get off the handle, don't we? We love to get angry because we want to show them how it is. And they're going to like it or not like it and they're going to have to deal with it because that's just who I am. See, when you're angry, press pause. When you're angry, go outside and have a little talk with Jesus. When you're angry, get off Facebook. When you're angry, press save, not send. When you're angry, be like God. Thirdly and finally, the question I want to ask, is it right to be resistant to love? Look at verses 10 and 11. But the Lord said, You have pity on this plant, for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up at night and perished in the night. Should I not have pity on Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern from their right and their left hand, and much livestock? Is it right to be resistant to love? That's our final question. Now, when we look at this and close this out, and I asked this, and, I, and as I discovered it more about Jonah, it really became mind-blowing to me. Because Jonah, he goes to Nineveh, he raises his voice against the Ninevites, he goes to let them know, hey, you're all going to be destroyed. The Ninevites, what the Ninevites represent are people that Jonah was resistant to love. People that he doesn't like. People whose lifestyle is really detestable to him. People who believe in things that really disgust his heart. And so what Jonah does is he raises his voice to say, you all will never exist. See, God doesn't want Jonah to say this. God doesn't do what Jonah says. And what God does is he spares the city because of what the Ninevites did. And Jonah says... I knew you were going to do that, God. I knew you were gracious and merciful and slow to anger. Now here's where things really get mind-blowing to me. What's Jonah do? He goes outside the city, builds himself a shelter, and he sets and watches what's going to happen to the city of Nineveh. He goes into Nineveh, he raises his voice, that you shall not be. And God says, I'm going to have mercy on these people. Jonah says, God, I knew you were going to do that. And then he goes outside and he watches what's going to happen to Nineveh. Now, the question of the night, why in the world during this time would Jonah go outside and watch what what, what would happen to Nineveh if he's already acknowledged that God is merciful and gracious? He's already acknowledged that. Now, why why in the world would he go outside and watch the city? Here's the answer. Jonah believes that this repentance is not sincere. He believes that the Ninevites and their repentance and what they believe, it's not real. And so he'll, he's going to go, he says, like many say today, well, they'll just go, well, they'll go back to their old ways tomorrow. They'll be like they were last week. Just give it a little bit of time. That's, that's very encouraging from a Christian, let me tell you. Very, very hopeful words for someone who's young in Christ. And so that's Jonah's mindset. Well, give it time. And they're going to go back to who they used to be. And then guess what? Oh, God's going to agree with me. I was right. That's what, that's what Jonah's mindset was. But God says, I'm going to have mercy. 
And so he raises his voice against those he's resistant to love. He goes outside and set. And if God will do what Jonah says God was going to do. And the reason I don't want you to miss this is because that's what a whole lot of people have been doing for a very long time in the church. Many are so eager to raise their voice against those who we are resistant to love. And it seems during these times of craziness in our world, we have a lot of Jonah tendencies. And so as we come to a close, I want to ask a question here. Who are your Ninevites? Where is your Nineveh? Maybe for you, uh, your Ninevites are the gay and lesbian couple who call themselves married. Um, maybe for you, uh, the Ninevites are this uh, fundamentalist, antifa, uh, protesting, wild, crazy group that's going on in, in our nation. Maybe that's your Ninevites. Uh, maybe for you, the Ninevites are these proponents of Planned Parenthood. Maybe for you, Nineveh could be these right wings with big wealth or left wings with big government. Who are your Ninevites? You see, what we have seen far too long in the church is we sit back, watch people, and criticize what's going on around us. And we live in fear while we can never really share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We say, we'll pray for them. We'll say, well, I love them. I'll pray for them. That's about as far as it goes. I really challenge each and every one of us to really, as we look at our society, to really get out of your comfort zone. You see, God raised a plant. He destroys the plant. He says to Jonah, you're more concerned about that plant than you are the people. And God says, I'm not politics. I'm not traditions. I'm not programs. I am the God of people who shows love and mercy even to the Ninevites who you don't like. You see, God is pro the people. He always has been. Who has been shaped in His divine image. To God, all lives matter. From the unborn to all ethnicity. And the world doesn't need to see anymore what the church is against. The world needs to see who we are for. And so like many of you, I'm concerned about this nation. I'm concerned about the future and what's going to be happening to the future generations. It's possible when you're disappointed that you thought God wouldn't do what you wanted to do. In your anger, slow down. Think. Think about things. As we come to a close uh, this evening and extend an invitation, um, there's always a typology truth in the scriptures. And what that means is there's a type and an anti-type. A comparison uh, to a physical element or a comparison to an individual in the Old Testament which compares to the church or Jesus Christ. And Jesus uh, kind of compared himself to Jonah in Matthew chapter 12. But as I was thinking about this typological truth in Jonah never did get to meet Jesus in the Old Testament. And we, we don't know that. Um, but I, I was thinking here, during this time of life that Jonah was in, if he had a little talk with Jesus, and he met Jesus face to face, what would the conversation be? And, and I just imagine it like this. Um, when Jesus and Jonah was uh, talking, and, and Jonah was explaining to Jesus about his situation. You know, Jonah was a complainer. And, and he, he told Jesus, he said, you don't know what it feels like, Jesus. You have no idea what it feels like. And Jesus said, try me. And Jonah said, well, for me, it's not easy. It's not easy, Jesus. You're the Son of God. It's not easy for me. It's easy for you. I had to go down for my comfort from where I was at to a place to minister to people who were my enemies. And Jesus said, oh really? Tell me more. Because I did that same thing. When I left the comfort, the prestige, and the pristine environment of heaven, was born of a virgin, flesh of a human, I came to my own. My own did not receive me. They nailed me to a cross. And from the cross I uttered the words of forgiveness that became redemption 
to the world. And Jesus said, what else, gentlemen? What else? Well, you don't understand. I spent three days and nights in a dark place. Jesus said, really? Then what happened? Well, after three days, I got spat out. Vomit. Nastiness. And Jesus said, well, I know something about deliverance. Coming out of dark places after three days and nights. I know what it feels like when you're in a dark place and there's no hope. You see, Jesus is our great deliverer, brothers and sisters. Jesus is our greater Jonah. And what Jesus has to offer is anything uh, more than what this world has to offer. What the government has to offer, whatever stimulus package, whatever uh, leader may tell you, whatever individual may tell you, nothing or no one in this world can deliver you from what Jesus has to offer. And if you need to make a decision tonight, and you've obeyed the gospel, but you've been living your own way, say, God, I'm not going to do it. And you've been angry. You've been angry at God because of your situation. You've been angry about the circumstances that's going on. God's asking you, is it right? Is it right for you to be angry? We need to think before we act sometimes. If you need to make a decision tonight, we want to offer an invitation to those who are in Christ who need to repent of their life, rededicate. Listen, there's no shame in that. There's no shame to rededicate and repent of your life. We should be doing it every day anyways. But if you're not a Christian, and you've heard the gospel preached, you know what it means to be saved, let me tell you again, just so that you know for sure what we say is right. And you, if you have your Bible, you can look at it. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Now, for God so loved the world, that's how much God loved the world, that He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Beautiful, John 3, 16. Everybody knows that verse, right? You know, Jesus even came to His own, and His own didn't receive Him. You must repent. Repent of your sins. Acts 2.38, we see the gospel invitation given by the Apostle Peter. He said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. But you also must confess Jesus Christ as Lord, as Messiah, as the Deliverer. If you need to make a decision, come out in faith, believing the Word of God, confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, repenting of your sins, being immersed in the watery grave of baptism. Listen, I don't like physical funerals, but I love spiritual funerals. I love to witness when someone dies and is born again into a new life. And that can happen tonight if you need to make that decision. And live the faithful life. James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed are those who endure all temptations and trials. When you have been approved, you will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love Him. We have got to remain faithful to the end. That's a lot of ups and downs at times. But we must remain faithful. At all costs and count the cost. There's a hymn of decision tonight. I have decided to follow Jesus. If you need to make a decision, I encourage you to step out now. We want to love on you and pray with you. Thank you all for your wonderful attention and for being here in the assembly tonight. Prayer meeting, Bible study this Wednesday at 6. Uh, is there any other updates, anything we need to make mention before we're dismissing prayer? Jesus, Thank you, Brother John. Amen. That's a good series on John. Yeah, I've really enjoyed going through that series. That's been a blessing. And I appreciate um, the encouraging words and those who've been listening. I, I really hope and pray that you've been encouraged through this series.
God bless each and every one of you. Brother Rodney, would you pray?